Prof. Yunus, uh, you know, typical of a professor, and I'm so happy to hear about that. Prof. Yunus will not be standing behind a roster. He instead will be will be standing right in front of all of you. The only thing I might have to tell Prof. Yunus, just to let you know that it's about 180 degrees from left to right about that. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I have a microphone, so it's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't know you were a singer. Oh, no. Wow. <laughs> We are in good hands. <laughs> but let's give the good prelude to the whole discussion because the issue the song raises, uh, I think, is very important for the discussion that we have uh, where we put them. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here, and I was very impressed by the campus and all the arrangement, beautiful uh, hall where I've been invited to speak. And thank you for doing that. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with my credit, that's what uh, I started doing, and it grew along the way. But not much probably is known about the activities that followed with it. This is the main current that my credit continued, but along with it, many other issues came. And I try to respond to that as we confront the situation as it came. So I'll try to go from a uh, little bit of introduction to microcredit to the other thing that continued alongside and later on drew me more and more into it. And in the entire narrative that I'll have about what I have been trying to do, uh, I'll draw your attention. I was always getting to problem and raise it big issue out of it because it puzzles me why the things the way it happens the way it happens and i see a uh, completely different thing out of that than the conventionally is talked about yeah. so how did it get involved in the lending money this is a common question people ask me so that if you're curious about it i should get it over with uh, i was a teacher teaching in a university similar to this, not as big as this, but it's located in a kind of area with lots of trees, lots of hilly areas and so on. It's a brand new university campus, Chittagong University. Uh, I, was start, I started teaching in 1972 when I came back from the States where I was teaching. I uh, came back because Bangladesh became independent after a long struggle, a lot of bloodshed. Uh, the independence movement, and it came back to Bangladesh when it became an independent country. So that's when all, all this started happening. Bangladesh was extremely poor, conditions were very bad at that time. We ended up with famine in country in 1974. And here I am teaching beautiful theories of economics. I love them. The more I teach, the more kind of thrill I get. It's so perfect, elegant theories. But my enthusiasm for those elegant theories started going down when the feminine hit us all around the country. And I cannot see the match between the elegance of those theories and the horrible things that you see on the other side of the people. So there is some kind of distance between the two. And I cannot see the link I couldn't establish the link between the two anymore. Then I came to the conclusion that everything that I teach in the classroom is a fiction. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the people. So all my enthusiasm disappeared because it's about fiction. Who needs a fiction when the hard reality is right next door to you? And your, all your quote unquote knowledge is totally useless in the face of a terrible problem with next door. So I felt, suddenly I felt totally useless person. I have no use for anybody anymore. Because I thought I knew something which I could communicate to other young people. That would be my use. But now I lost that too. Out of that frustration, I thought I have to regain some use in me. What kind of use would that be? So I made it very simple for me. I said, can I make, my, make myself useful to one single human being, at least, so that I know that I have some use for somebody else? 
So uh, following that idea, what I started doing, going to the next door village. The university that I was teaching is surrounded by village. So I don't have to go elsewhere. As you cross the boundary of the beautiful university campus, you come to a sensory old village with all the problems of the village, poverty, and everything that goes with it. That could be real world, from the campus to the real world. So I started going there with the hope that I can make myself useful to at least one person, even for a day. So I just tried to do a lot of little things here, little things there, to see if I can be of some help to somebody. And then I feel a little better that at least I'm not that totally useless to everybody else. But I'll, not, I'll skip all those experiences, go straight into the issue. I keep seeing many things in the village which I know I knew nothing about. I heard about it, read about it, but I had no practical experience of it. Loan sharking. Giving tiny loans to poor people and grab everything that they have in the name of the law. And you meet the victims, all the sad stories, everything she lost. You meet the guy who made her the victim, nice guy, smiling face, don't see anything wrong with him, but he is the one who does all those terrible things, and there are many of them. And you feel completely puzzled. How do you stop that? It's an age-old thing going on, years and years, all over the country, all over the region, all over the world. Nothing can be done about it. What's wrong with this? What kind of economics I have learned that there is no solution to give me how to address this particular issue. Then the tiny little money can be so cruel. After several days of thinking, worrying about it, I came up with an idea. Yes, I can do something. Not for the whole world, but few people in this village. And that's my ambition, to do something for whatever number I get. What did I do? Why don't I lend the money myself? The argument is, if I lend the money to them, they don't have to go to the loan shop. Problem is solved. So I don't have to have a research project. I don't have to have a publication. I just take the money from my pocket and start lending money. And the problem is solved. I like that idea. And immediately went this way, started lending money from day one. I had no idea whether people would like it, whether people would actually benefit from it. It's my idea that if at least he or she doesn't have to go to the law shop because he got the money from me. And he is protected from the law shop. When I went to do it, it became instant popular program. Everybody loved it. So I started lending money. I was very happy that they responded so with so such an enthusiasm. It became bigger and bigger. I was not worried about it. I felt happy about it. Must have done something good to them that they are coming back to me to borrow money. But after several months, I started realizing soon I'll be running out of my money. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot go all right. What do I do? Another story begins. I idea, why don't they go to the bank right in the campus? Tell the manager why didn't you lend the money to the poor people? And it is bank's job, not my job. So I went to the bank, told the manager, you should lend the money, I'm doing it. They said, no, bank cannot lend money to poor people. They gave me the biggest lesson in banking. I was puzzled. I thought he would be so happy to do this, it's such an easy way, I've already seen in the ground. He said, no, that's uh, something, some crazy people can do that. Bank cannot do that. So I get into an argument, long argument, it never ended. Still those arguments continue with me and the banking. We never get settled this issue. I kept telling that it's a funny thing. Old bank, the concept of bank was created 
so that you can take the deposit from people and lend the money to the people who need it. You do it in such a funny way. You lend the money to people who already have lots of money. <laughs> and you don't lend the money to people who don't have money. It doesn't make sense. They laugh at me. Look how innocent this guy is. He doesn't even understand banking. I said, no, I don't. I said, to me, it's totally illogical. You should have done that way. You should be lending money to the people who don't have money. Now I realize, gradually I realize, the whole world is that way. No bank lends money to people who don't have money. So what do I do? I have to find a way to continue my program. And bank says no. They cannot do that. It's impossible for a bank to do that. After several months of running around, hitting onto the door of a single bank, that they are CEOs, everybody giving the same answer. I came up with a proposal. The proposal is, I know you can't lend the money, your rules don't permit. Why don't you accept me as a guarantor? I'll become a guarantor and sign all your papers, and you give the money. If they don't pay, I'll pay. Now they are suspicious about me. <laughs> <laughs> what is this guy talking about? Are you serious? Why should he pay for the people? Nobody will pay back anyway. Why should he pay back? So they were in effect. They want to keep my mouth shut because I'm yapping too much. At the same time, they can't figure out why I'm proposing myself as a guarantor. To make the story short, ultimately, they accepted me as a guarantor. If not for anything else, at least to Keep my mouth shut. So yeah, give him some money so that he doesn't make too much noise. I was happy. I now take the money from the bank, sign all the papers. I don't even read. Did you ever try to read bank's papers? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody reads that. So I just sign whatever they ask me to sign and get the money. That's the whole thing. It became very popular. And that was the story and people were paying back. Banks were gradually becoming reluctant because it's becoming bigger and bigger, from one village to several villages and more villages. I got very enthusiastic. It's working, people paying every penny of it. I had no problem whatsoever. Then I realized that I cannot rely on these banks. They are doing it very reluctantly. I don't need any reluctant bank with me. Then idea hit me, why don't I create my own bank? Everybody said, oh, government will never give, give you the license. You are nobody. But I want to try, I have some examples. So, after three years of trial, finally I got the permission from the government, from the central bank, everybody, to create a bank. We started in 1976, became a full bank with a license in 1983. We were absolutely delighted. We wanted to conquer the whole country with microcredit. The word microcredit didn't exist at that time. When it became popular in other countries, then they wanted to use a word. So they asked, what is the word you should use? What is it that you're doing? And it's tiny home. In Bangla, it translates more as a microcapital. But when it's translated in English, it became microcredit. Okay, microcredit, that's what we do. So we have a new coin, newly coined word in English language, microcredit. We are very, very happy. So that was the beginning, and it continued to expand. It became nationwide. Today, we have 9 million borrowers in Bangladesh. 97% are women. We focused on women. It was, a, again, a tough job because women are so reluctant to take this money. They are not jumping around to get the money. They were just running away from us. Our colleagues, they tell us, when they enter the village from one side, the women run to the other side. <laughs> they are coming to give you money. <laughs> and they were afraid of money. So I tell my colleagues, they are girls, because as a man, I cannot go. So the girls will go and talk to them. 
just said, well, this is not going to work. I said, well, always remember when a woman says, I don't want to touch this man, I don't want to take money from you, because I never did anything with money. I never held money in my hand. I'm afraid of it. Why don't you give it to my husband? I said, whenever you hear this, always remember that when she says all this, this is not her voice. This is the voice of the history which created her. So she's only coming from the history. The voice of the history, she said. Ever since she was born, she was told again and again, you brought misery to the family, being a drug child. You should have been a boy, and instead you are a girl. So she grew up as a very apologetic person. She just doesn't want to disrupt anybody's happiness by seeing her face, showing her face or something, being seen any place. She remains with John the other day. Now that you are giving this money, you think you will jump at it? No, the thing is that another terrible thing will happen to the family if something goes wrong. So she doesn't want to get involved with that. I said, our job is to go back to her again and again and peel off the layers of layers of history around her so that we can find the real person hiding inside of the history. So it's not simply giving money, it's also undoing of the history that created the present person. So that is the job we are focusing on. It took us six years to achieve that. Our ambition was to make half the borrowers in my program with women, 50-50 borrowers. That was a, such a big struggle. But when we made it, it felt so good. Finally, we've done it. Everybody says it's impossible. We made it possible. Then we started noticing money going to the family through women, brought so much more benefit to the family than the same amount of money going to the family through men. So you can write a whole book about it before it happens, but in every single case it happens. So seeing that again and again, we said, what is this big deal about 50-50? We created an artificial thing. Remove it. Just focus on one of Because they are the best bet for rallying the whole thing, the whole family, and move on with their life. So we removed that. As a result, gradually we moved nearly 100%. So we stopped at 97%. Historically, we stayed here. 97% women, 3% men. So this is, these are the kind of things we are doing. And as you work with the poor people, you face lots of other problems. Not just money, non-monetary problems. The first thing we hit was the problem of night blindness. Children in the family cannot see after the sun goes down. I had no idea. In my book, I never learned those things. In my education, in the whole process, I never learned those things. Suddenly I go there, the children cannot see as the sun goes down. I ask the doctors, health officials, what is this? That this is a disease, it's called night blindness. Exactly what happened. Is there any cure? Yes, there is a cure, very simple cure. What kind of cure? This is due to vitamin A deficiency. Let them have vitamin A tablets. If they don't have vitamin A tablets, ask them to eat vegetables, green vegetables, which are particularly the one with lots of vitamin A. So we opted for vegetables. We tried many ways to encourage them to take green vegetables. They couldn't. Yeah, they went on and did the same thing. So we came up with the idea, we made these vegetable seeds, put them into tiny little packets, fraction of a penny, just one tiny packet. Very, various vegetable seeds in various packets. And as we go to them for our daily routine work, we also carry the vegetable seed packets and sell them. And people like this. And they started using this, growing vegetables around their house, and eating them themselves, eating, feeding their children. As Grameen Bank grew over the country, 
our vegetables need business growth. We keep it as a separate business so that it doesn't become the burden of the bank. So that we cover the cost. At one point, we became the largest vegetable seed seller in the country. <laughs> and we're very happy that we have this title now with the biggest vegetable seed seller. Because we go to villages every single household. Not only we sell it to the government bank borrowers, villagers like it, they buy it from us, we sell it. And by that time, night man has disappeared from the country. Wow. Such a simple thing. We said, why can't you do something like that? Why can't you do something? You don't need a doctor, you don't need big pharmacy, big clinics to do that. Simple intervention, persuading people in a way they like it. I could have done it. Remember, I could have done it giving free seed distribution, what would happen? I would have done for one month, I would have done for one year. Then they stop because it becomes heavy burden on the bank because it's not my money, it's the bank's money. I didn't want this to be a burden on the bank. I wanted to make it self-sustaining. So I priced it in a, so that I can cover the cost. That's very particular about it. Ever since we did anything, we always make careful we did it in a sustainable way. We introduced one after another, sanitary and electric. The country didn't have any place to go in the electric. There is no latrine in the country. The concept of latrine didn't exist. People have to go there, out there, anywhere they want. And this is something that you have to deal with. I tried to explain to them. This is spread disease, it's very bad for your children, your family, you pass on your, all the diseases from one to another. Then I made a rule. We were still a small bank at that time when we raised this issue. We made a rule. If you want to join Grameen Bank, first thing you have to do, you have to dig a hole and use it as a picture clip. Everybody opposed it. No, why should we do that? What's wrong with this? I said, no, if you want to join the government bank, this is the only way you can do that. So those who are already in government bank, they didn't bother to dig a hole. But they did one thing good for us. Whenever anybody came to consult with them how to join government bank, how to get the money from government bank, they always said it in a very strong voice. First, go and dig a hole. <laughs> Otherwise, they want to talk to you. So they became our promoter. As a result, it became part, integral part of Grameen Bank. If you want to join Grameen Bank, you have to think about it. <laughs> then is that it, it's now everywhere. We came up with the idea. We started giving a separate loan, additional loan. On top of your income generating loan, we give this additional loan to set up a sanitary industry. But if you to talk about sanitary industry, where do you get it? So we created a separate company to produce sanitary electric in the village. We give the money, we tell them, go there, pay this money, they will come and install it for you. Very simple. And don't worry about paying back. You can pay it back over a long period of time, just a tiny little money. You can take one year, two years, three years, doesn't matter. As long as you can keep on paying whatever you want to pay. So it became, again, a part of the government bank history. So when I talk about 9 million borrowers, you can remain guaranteed that all 9 million families have their sanitary latrine. And then it is spread, because nobody has sanitary latrine in the village. So when the Grameen borrowers started having them, they had a tiny little house, or a shack, or a whatever hut they had, but they have sanitary latrine. The well of families, their women started complaining to their men. How come even the beggar woman has a sanitary latrine? We don't have it. <laughs> because it's such a painful thing for women to wait until the sun goes down so that she can go out. For men it's easy, they go any time they want, but not for women. So a latrine became a social kind of liberation for them. That for the first time they can go any time they want. And that's why it created so much pressure in the villages. Now it became almost universal in Bangladesh having a sanitary latrine. 
You read about Modi's campaign now. Have been Senator elected. Such a tough job. But we did it within the bank itself. We integrated in such a way, people didn't even notice that what we have done. We did one after another like this. And people ask me, why are you doing all these things? I said, because there is a problem, and I try to solve the problem. And I try to solve it in a way I don't have to go to a donor to give me the money. I don't do it as a charity. I could have done it as a charity, each one of them, but I didn't know. Then I took the whole thing and got the next stage, much bigger. Started setting up hospitals, eye care hospitals. Cataract is a common problem in Bangladesh. And people traditionally accept it. As you grow old, you see less. No complaint. What can you do? But science has changed it all. Now people go to the city, get their operation. City folks have their operation, their cataract operation, get to less you see. Beautiful. No problem at all. But the villagers don't have any. They can't come to the city. Most families can't come to the city because it costs so much. When you go to a doctor in the city, in particular the capital city, you can't go alone. Traditionally, you have to bring the whole family with you because you're going to see a doctor. Particularly if it's related to eye, it's a very sensitive thing. And so you can't bring the family, you don't go there. So we thought, why don't we bring the cataract operation in the village? First IPR hospital we built in the northern part of Bangladesh, in the village. Beautiful hospital with 10,000 cataract operation capacity per year. And it started doing that. And we wanted to make sure we cover our cost. So what we do at the top level, people who can pay, they pay the market price and we make money. And the people at the bottom who cannot pay, we just charge an insignificant amount that just $1. We do the same operation, same lens, same surgeon, but one dollar. We cover the cost by the profit that we make. We came to break even point in four years. We were so delighted, we made it. Then we set up a second hospital in the southern part of the country. It came into break even point in three years. We were extra happy. So our, then we felt this argument became back and forth. Why are you doing business? You call it a business, but you don't run that business. Say, I'm running that business. What's wrong? I said, no, you're not take, taking the profit out of it. I said, is there a law in Bangladesh that I have to take profit out of my business? Otherwise, I'll get punished, I'll put in jail. So I'm not violating any rule. Simply, I'm saying, I'm creating these businesses to solve problems, not to make money for myself. That's all I'm saying. But that kind of business doesn't exist in the book. I said, I'm not reading the book. That's my advantage. I just do what I think is right. If you want, you can put them into the book, but until then, I do it. <laughs> so I had to debate became so intense that I had to give it a name. So if I gave it a name, I called it social business. Define it by saying, this is a non-dividend company to solve human problems. Investors never take any profit out of it, except for taking back the investment money, whatever you invested. Your investment money you can take back. But you still you own the back business. But you don't take any profit out of it after that, because it's rolled back into the business for expansion. So when we have two IPR hospitals coming to the break-even point, we're getting the money back. By your definition, you have to get you get the money back. We are taking the money back, and we get the money back, we in, invest in a third hospital. So the third hospital is running. Well, three of the hospitals we are taking back, we will put in the fourth hospital, fourth hospital under construction. So it's a self-expanding system. All we did is to take away the whole idea of making money personal. Then the debates become more intense. If you take away the whole incentive of profit from business, Nothing left of the business. Profit is the 
incentive in the whole world. I said, well, maybe. I will accept that profit is a great incentive in the world for business. But I don't accept that the only incentive. I said, there are many other incentives in the world. We should respond to all the incentives. Why only profit incentives? What other incentives? I give examples. To simplify it, what I said, like this. I said, making money is an incentive. Because making money is a happiness. More money you make, more happy you get. I said, making money is a happiness. Making other people happy is a super happiness. <laughs> <laughs> you take it, sir? So you decide what you want to do. I want you to stay away from the charity part. Charity is a wonderful thing. I applaud it because the whole world has been saved by this charity. But charity has a limitation. When you want to solve a problem with charity, charity money goes out, solves the problem, but the money never comes back. That's called charity. I said, what I'm doing now, I create social business, social business money goes out, does the job, it comes back. Then you can use it again and again and again, endlessly, it becomes very powerful. The social business money is more powerful. I said, the difference between the two, charity and social business, I take the objective of charity and put a business agenda behind it and achieve the objective. Since it's backed by the business engine, money comes back. When I did the seed business, money keeps coming back. I kept investing more and more, money keeps coming back. So I have no limit to stop. When I'm doing the cataract operation, same thing. I can explain it as many times as you want because money keeps coming back. I invested, I trained the doctors, nurses, and so on. Money comes back. So it becomes very powerful. I don't have to go to a donor. Going to donor is a very painful experience for me at least. I don't know how your experience is. <laughs> First of all, you remain totally uncertain whether it's going to get it or not. So your whole idea remains in a limbo whether you can make it or not. And makes you nervous. And then on top of it, you spend more time in raising money than doing the job. That's the waste of time. I said, I want to get out of this. I'm, I'm not saying charity is not right, charity is very important, but I chose the path that I concentrate everything in the social business way. That kept on expanding. Then many big businesses became interested in our company. <coughs> First one was Danone. Danone is a French company. They got very excited about our idea of social business. They contacted me, they want to do a social business with us. We created a social business in Bangladesh to solve the problem of malnutrition among the children. Half the children of Bangladesh are malnourished. And if you are malnourished, your child is malnourished, their growth is stunted, they are not as healthy, as tall as anybody else, everybody else. So physically they are stunted, and similarly mentally your mental development suffers if you are malnourished. So I said, what a bad start, what a terrible start for the nation with malnutrition. So there are many efforts being done by the government, by the NGOs. We did another one. So we did it in a social business way. We created a special kind of yoga. The Danone is a yoga company. They know how to do this. So we did a small cup of yoga, produced, designed it, all the micronutrients which are missing in the children are put in the yogurt. And if you put all those micronutrients in a cup of yogurt, I can bet you it will taste very ugly because these are chemicals that you are putting there. But since they alone is an expert on taste, they manipulate it in such a way, suppress the ugly taste, give you the most delicious taste for the children. They love it. No we sell it, house by house in the poor family, Children love it. It's so cheap that everybody buys it. As a child eats this yogurt every day, over six or seven months, they recover, start recovering the malnutrition status to the healthy status. So you're doing it as a business, 
but it's not the business of the kind we are talking about. You want to make money. If the one was doing yoga, they would like to make money. Here, they did it completely separately. That there, they will not take any profit out of their business. They are entitled to take back the investment money, nothing more than that. They love this idea. Now they are spreading it all over the world, the idea of social business. In many countries, they are setting up social business because they have to address those crippled problems in various ways. One example I'll give is coming from an interesting company called McKay. I never heard of the name McKay. I'm sure you never heard of it either. So when they approached me, they are interested in social business. I said, well, that's great. They gave examples of others doing it. I said, what can we do? I said, first, let me know who you are. What kind of company are you? The guy who was talking to me, he was embarrassed that I didn't know about that. He said, do you like French fries? I said, yeah, I like French fries. Next time you eat French fries anywhere in the world, remember, you are eating McCain French fries. I said, oh my God, we are big. <laughs> he said, yes, we are big. We are 60% of the French fry business in the world. It's a Canadian company. So we became very friends, good friends. We started doing social business in Colombia, where we were very active in doing social business. This was a very beautiful social business. That excited them. They excited them so much they want to do it in Europe. France is one of the top potato producers in, the, in, the, in Europe. Large quantity of potatoes. And McKay is one of the top buyer of those potatoes. The McKay invited me to come to France to launch a new social business for France. I said, tell me what it is. What kind of thing. I said, you'll, you'll love it, but we'll explain to you when you come. You promise you come, then we'll have a big ceremony. I said, oh, okay, but unless you have, until you have explained, I will not attend the ceremony. <laughs> I don't know what you have in mind, but after I understand and accept it, then I will attend the ceremony. What I will come. So I went, then I read the whole story, and I love this. 26% of the potato grown in France are thrown away. Why? Because those potatoes, no buyer would, no commercial buyer will buy it. Why? This potato is not shaped right for French fry. You need to have a right shape for French fry. It's not good for French fry, it's not good for chips. Shape wise, machine doesn't like them. So they are thrown away. And this is tradition, everyone accepts it, farmers throw it away. Because they have no use for it. They can't eat all those potatoes, chunks and chunks of potatoes. It's a tradition that everybody accepts. There's nothing new. No complaint. Now that McCain became involved in social business, suddenly they have a new eye. They said, used to have money-making glasses before. We see where to make money. You changed those glasses for us. You gave, me so you gave us social business classes. We see opportunity for social business now. And this is another question. What are they doing? They are buying up all the throwaway potatoes. They create a company, a new company, and buy up all the throwaway potatoes, very cheap price. Farmers are very happy that they can get some money out of it. And produce potato soup. What a simple solution. Nobody has thought about it. And one of the French, top French chefs, he got so excited with the idea, he came up with a special recipe for potato soup. He said, you can use my image, my picture, in your packet, and I'll, and my recommendation that this is a social business soup, and I created a special recipe for this. It became a very popular potato soup in France, selling to supermarkets and so on. So what used to be thrown away food, good quality food, there's nothing wrong with those potatoes. Simply it doesn't fit into a French fry machine. That was their crime. Nobody bought it. Now they become soup. Getting into that, it became so popular, people loved it, everybody was so happy in McCain. They started noticing something, another thing. That I have no idea who it was. 
There's a class of vegetables all over Europe called ugly vegetables. I don't know if you heard that. Do you teach in the classroom ugly vegetables? It's an important business concept, ugly vegetables. They don't buy these vegetables. Supermarket chain do not buy this. Why? Because in the supermarket, all vegetables have to be military formation. <laughs> right size, right shape, right color. What is the crime of these ugly vegetables? Why they are ugly? They are not in those military formations. Either the top is too fat, tail is too thin, or it's not fat in the middle, it's supposed to be even. No. One third of all the vegetables grown in Europe thrown away because they're ugly vegetables. McCain came up. They said, we now have another idea. We now buy up all the ugly vegetables in France, chop them off, so that nobody know what shape it was. <laughs> you name the nice little packets, ready to cook vegetables. Now, the, the food that is thrown away, one third of all vegetables, but it's not a tiny thing, came back. People love it. It's cheap because it's a throwaway vegetable anyway, so you can afford to make it very cheap because people are selling it in a very low price. See how social business idea comes? So we have a series of social businesses coming one after another. Where does this social business come from? From the song that you sang. Then sang in the beginning. See, people forget. Imagine if this song was sung at the beginning of every business school class. <laughs> <laughs> Think of that. You laugh and see? Something to be laughed. But this is real. Everybody applauded it. But in business class, they would say, What is this? Are we paying for this? That's the mismatch. What we are as human beings is not recognized by the business world. It's not recognized by business. Because theory, the capitalist theory that we all follow so religiously interprets human beings as someone who is driven by self-interest. That is the basic, that's the core of the entire capitalist system. I said, that's the gross misinterpretation of a human being. Human being is not only driven by self-interest. There are other interests also, an equally important interest. The song takes it all beautifully. What are other interests that drive us? It's not recognized by the business world. So I said, human beings are not one dimensional thing. As we accept that one dimension of being, we became robots, money-making robots. We are not robots, we are human beings, composing of all those values that we have inside us. But we created a whole beautiful theory of economics, which has no room for any one of this. That is the end of the whole problem. So I said, why don't we create a business different? Business on all those values not on money making, can be done. And social business is a selflessness driven business. I'm doing it not by self-interest, I'm doing it for the interest of others. As I said, making money is a happiness, making other people a super happiness. That's what it is. So this is the driven part of it. We continue to do that. So that, that way it is in, encourages young people to look at it, business community to look at it, we create a lot of those social business. The last one that hit us very hard and continue to worry me a lot, I want to share that. This year, Oxfam has just announced eight rich people in the world, just eight rich people in the world own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the entire world. And who are these people? We know them. New York Times published their pictures. Very friendly people, we meet them, we take selfie with them. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with them. Then where is it going? Why all the wealth is in their hands? 
because of the system that we built. We cannot get out of it. That's just to push us all the wealth in a few hands. And gradually it becomes fewer and fewer hands. So these eight people, last year, Oxfam did the same thing. There were 62 people who owned more wealth than the bottom 57. This year, it's eight people who own more wealth than 30. What will be the next year? January. One, two, or none? Or half of one person? Not to the full. Just one half of one person's wealth will be more than all the wealth of the bottom 57. And I keep, say, I keep saying that this is a ticking time bomb. It will explode. People will not take it easy. You have 99% of the world population owning 1% of the whole world. It cannot go on like this. It is unsustainable. It is not something that we can carry on. So how do we address that? Two things. One, if you all get into social business, side by side, I'm not throwing away the conventional business. You can do both. But the more you go into social business, the less we will work concentration because I'm not getting any money for myself. The more you get that, less wealth will be generated for me because I'm generating the wealth for the rest of the people. It will be distributed. Third one, the second part came very quickly from my experience in coming back. We made all these women start business and so on. And we made sure that children go to school, have education, get them education loan, they have higher education. Then they say we don't have jobs. Bangladesh doesn't have jobs. Millions and millions of people. Imagine nine million families. How many young people? If you take two per family, 18 million young people. So millions of young people. They complain. And now they started counter complaint. I said, who asked you to have a job? How do you get this strong idea of job? I said, job is an obsolete idea. You don't even think about it. It should, it should have ended in the last century. It's such an obsolete. Somehow it's like this. I said, remind yourself that I'm not a, I'm not a job seeker. I'm a job creator. If, If you are a job seeker, you feel small to begin with. And young people feeling small, that is the greatest crime in earth. Why a young person at the beginning of his life or her life still feels small? He is the, the top of the world. Feel like the top of the world. Be a job creator, feel like a job creator, and feel strong and tall. tall. That's the beginning. And be a job creator. I said, look at the entire history of mankind. We never in our history worked for somebody else. When we were in the caves millions of years back, we were not sending job applications. <laughs> what did we do? We were at go-getters. That's what we are. That's what the human beings are all about. We are go-getters. We are problem solvers. That's why we fought with the nature and the environment so that we can establish our right on this planet. We are gatherers, we are hunters, we are farmers. We didn't work for somebody else. That idea came with the idea of capitalist system. Some people will be entrepreneurs and everybody else has to work for them. I said that is the wrong interpretation given by the theory. He said all human beings are born as entrepreneurs. They made us forget that. Made us into working for somebody. I said, no human being is born to work for somebody else. It is not in the destiny of the human being. Human being is a creative entity. It's unlimited creativity is what for human being. And look at the job. Job cuts you into a little human being. Takes away all your creative power. Only creativity, what they can use but the office will be used there. Otherwise, this is a material. I said, I don't want to give up my creative power just for the day. What they give it to me? Why don't I create my own enterprise, own thing? They said, well, the unemployment problem 
is part of the human destiny. No, it's not a human destiny. We created that artificial human destiny. Unemployment is not in Bangladesh, it's not in India, it's everywhere. You go to Europe, it's unemployment. 48% of the young people in Spain are unemployed. 40% of the Italians, your young people are unemployed. And you go country by country, you'll see 20%, 25%. What does it mean? Why young person remain idle? I said, there is no, it doesn't make sense. Human being is not born to sit idle. Human being is a go getter. That's what the human beings are all about. Now, somehow theory has put a spell on us. Spell on these young people. No, you don't have a job, so you sit there. Because I can't lift my limbs anymore. It doesn't make sense. So we said, we'll go do that. So what I tell the Bangladeshi young people to do that, particularly in Brahmin countries, they said, well, nobody taught us how to start a business. We got a degree, but to learn this, this, but not what business. I said, well, you are the children of Brahmin families. Your mother is a Brahmin bank borrower. And most likely she started her coming back journey 30 years back, 20 years back. She took $30 loan, $50 loan to start her business. If your illiterate mother can take $30 loan and become an entrepreneur, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with your education? You are telling me that nobody taught you? Who taught your mother? Nobody. She's just scared to death. But she took that money, she took the challenge. And over time, she made her business grow faster and faster. And that's where you are born. And you are telling me that you don't know anything about this. I said, go back to your mother. <laughs> and learn everything I ever learned. Now learn from your heart. And she is the direction that you follow. If you don't know how to design a business, sit on her feet, find out how she became, how did she create a business of her own. It's there, simply, you never bother to do that. That's the whole thing. Now what we have done, we create a social business fund, a sort of venture capital fund in Bangladesh. Ask every young person, come with a business idea. Once you like the business idea, and we invest in that business as a partner. Not like a venture capitalist who wants to make money. We, in social business, we don't have to make money for ourselves. We simply tell them, you make it successful, and we'll be with you as a partner. And when you're successful, you just return them and we do it. And you are a lawyer. Continue. If you need the second round, come back to us. We'll be there. And now we started with four, five, ten young people coming with business ideas, very shaky. It came to 100 per month. Now we do 800 per month last December. This year we do 2,000 per month. Right now we have over 12,000 young people in the villages, power park villages, boys, girls coming with business ideas. It's becoming bigger and bigger. It's only our capacity is not growing fast enough to handle them. So there's no shortage of ideas. Tell them, people say, what? Unemployment to entrepreneurship? They are not entrepreneurs. I said, put the money in front, everybody will become entrepreneurs. <laughs> That's what we say. When we gave them, I took it, oh, these women, they're not entrepreneurs. I said, you just give the money. So once you sweep the money, you become entrepreneurs. <laughs> Everybody becomes entrepreneurs. This is there. Ideas after ideas come. All we have done, if you take one unemployed person in Singapore, I hope Singapore doesn't have any unemployed. Suppose there is one. <laughs> and he has a brilliant business idea. No bank in Singapore or anywhere in the world will invest in this young guy. You are asking for paper, there are certain this, which he doesn't have. And he doesn't have experience. He doesn't, you don't have experience, you don't have any wealth. Know. That's the wrong thing that we have the financial system. So until we fix the financial system, we are stuck. With the, the financial system is the one popping up all the wealth to the top. So we can redesign the financial system, 
which will be redistributed, everybody will have access. And we have, this is not just a story. We do it in Bangladesh in everyday way. Some of them we do it in, uh, every month we do one of those sessions of young entrepreneurs coming with a business idea publicly on live stream, so you can watch it from here. And we do it in English, translating in English. The conversation goes on Bangla, but someone always translating in English. So if you're curious how we do it, who is this guy, who is this girl coming from a village to start the business? How much money does she need? On the memory so far, we have given about $1,500 a piece. So imagine 12,000 people, $1,500 a piece. That's the total amount of investment we have. We have no problem. And we made it very simple. Nobody is rejected. This is our goal. This is our policy. Nobody is rejected. If you don't like your business plan, we work together so that we can improve, but you're not thrown away. Oh, this is lousy. That's not what we do. We work with you and create the one that we like and we invest. Nobody is abandoned. Many of your business fail. <laughs> and you say, okay, we tell you, we know that we don't do that. We say, well, it's our business, not your business. Together, it's our business. We want to make sure you're successful. Until you're successful, we'll work with you. We'll never give you up. So that's the thing. Once we bring all these things together, we can redesign the world the way we want to have. Design the world which is not based on greed, based on all the values that you heard in the music, in the song this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.